Welcome to a new episode of Delphine Circle, where we uncover the mind, body, and spirit of success. Subscribe now for free to receive updates on the latest interviews. Then sit back, relax, and tune in. Hi, Frank. Welcome to The Circle. Thank you. So happy to have you here. Thank you. We met recently through our mutual friend, Mario Aros. Yes. Uh, I remember Mario telling me about you, and because I'm saying, who's this guy that sends you these insulting text messages every day with <laughs> flipping you off and stuff? <laughs> Do it every morning. Yep. He's like, you got to meet Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so you are a certified public accountant. Yes. Of the rich and famous. That too. The OG of CPAs, yes. I like to call you. Yes. Um, so much to cover in your interview today, but I want to start kind of with current times and kind of work our way back. Is that okay? Very good. So in 2011, you were diagnosed with uh, mystatic bladder cancer. Mystatic, yeah. Stage four. Stage four. And uh, you were given three to four months to live, as I understand that. That's correct, yes. And... Um, there's so much that has come out of that, but take me back to that day. And I think we all think about getting that piece of information and what that must be like. So can you tell us a little bit about that day? I woke up in my room after having the biopsy on my shoulder bone and the doctor walks in and says, by the way, you have two to four months to live. You have stage four cancer. And I got out of bed and threw him up against the wall and said, you're not God, get out of my room. And he called security on me. And they escorted me out of the hospital. And then I went to MD Anderson and asked for their opinion. And two to four months to live. And then I ended up in City of Hope. You went to the City of Hope? Yes. You met Dr. Sumanta Paul? Dr. Paul, yes. Um, a legend now in this town. Absolutely. and. He told you, work with me, and uh, I can't promise I'll cure you, but I'll keep you alive for at least four years. That's what he told me. Yeah. He doesn't remember. He doesn't remember that. Telling me that. I said, don't you think I would? Yeah. He meant 11. <laughs> yeah. 15, yeah. 20. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he says I'm going to live forever. He calls me the cockroach. <laughs> so... I mean, did you believe him when you heard that information? What were you thinking? Absolutely. Yeah. I thought he was Doogie Howser. Yeah. He's, he's such a young man, you know. So you started going into the treatment. And uh, tell me, how did how did everybody around you respond to this? How was your friends and family and clients responding? Well, they were really scared. My daughter was really scared because her mother died of cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, she didn't want to lose me. And... It was, uh, it was a rough time. It was a rough time. I had uh, 18 treatments of radiation, and then I had three years of chemo every Saturday for three years. So it was rough. Yeah. It was rough. You followed everything he told you? Uh, yeah. He, uh, he told me that the chemo wasn't working. Would I be willing to try something? And I said, sure, I'll try anything. So I did. And uh, I took this drug twice. And uh, I called him up and I said, Doc, I said, I've taken two Dilaudids, which is a very high pain pill, and two shots of Grand Marnier. <laughs> and he says, you trying to kill yourself? I said, Doc, the pain is unbearable. Show me this drug is working and I'll take it. Other than that, I'd rather die. He says, can you come in? I said, yeah. So I had Ray Jacoby drive me to City of Hope and they did a scan. The president of City Hope came out and said, come with me, and cancer was gone. Wow. I was in remission. And they took my pick line out and just come back every three months for scans. And it was just that, that amazing. It yeah. was, I start crying. Yeah. Sure wasn't the Grand Marnier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That experience really, um, catapulted you and it, oh, it gave you a mission. You took on the task of deciding to raise money for more research and to help the City of Hope. You've done a phenomenal job. I think a lot Thank of people you. have heard about the Let's Be Frank About Cancer events. Yes. Um, I got to attend in this last function and it was spectacular, beautiful. Yes. Um, my good friend Scott Madison was also featured at that event yes. as uh, as was you. Um, 
tell me about those events and, and how you got that idea. Well, for 20 years, I used to do it called the Gift of Hope event for muscular dystrophy. And then when I got cancer, I said, I'm, when I was in remission, I said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life raising money now for cancer. Jerry Lewis had uh, just been let go from muscular dystrophy. So I, I was mad at them. I didn't want anything to do with them after mm. they let him go. And uh, so I just turned everything around and, and had the same guest list as I had for 20 years. So I already had a following, most of which were my clients. And, uh, and I'd always name a person of the year. And uh, we'd always, we've raised almost close to $8 million. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I talked to Jamie Byrne. She's the yeah. coordinator that helps you put on all mm -hmm. of those events. She's spectacular. And she told me, I think she said 8.2 million mm -hmm. in all of those, uh, over those events. And tell me a little bit about how the money is being used and what City of Hope's doing now. It's going for research for Dr. Powell. Okay. So he, being, he brings in people from all over the world, doctors from all over the world, and they stay a month at City of Hope. And they do research with them, mm -hmm. hope, hopefully to find a, a cure for cancer. And that's what it's used for. And then uh, th then I did the City of Hope uh, clinic at uh, Fashion Island. I drive and, past it. It's right yeah. by the, the, the bus and station. That's Dr. Shahabi. I uh, introduced him to the president of City of Hope, and they put that deal together. And then we put a deal together for the City of Hope Hospital at Five Points with Emil Haddad. So I'm looking forward to that. And September is the grand opening awesome. of that. So it's, uh, it's been quite a ride. That's know? incredible for us to have a yeah. hospital yeah. of that caliber yeah. here in Orange County. Absolutely. You did a great job bringing that. Um, you know, I will say that uh, when I was reading up about you and I got to read all about the work that you did with muscular dystrophy. You had a, a long relationship with, with Jerry Lewis, right? Oh, he was a client of yours. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, he was a fun guy. Every time I flew to Vegas to go over his books, I, he joked around. We'd have dinner every night. and He was hilarious. He was just a wonderful person. You know, his wife was a sweetheart. His daughter. Uh, I got her into Chapman. And uh, How did you two meet? Jerry Lewis? Mm -hmm. Uh Met through Liberace, actually, yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. So it's been years since uh, they were friends. Yeah. So he had asked Liberace who his accountant was and told him me, and that's how we got started. Yeah. Do you have any fun stories about Jerry Lewis? <laughs> yeah, things I can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> So you're, you, Vegas was your home for, for many years. Um, six years. Six years. Yeah. Your uh, client, Jack Urich, uh, famous oil millionaire, yeah. bought the Tropicana and brought you over to be the CAPA for, for Tropicana. Exactly. What yeah. was it like uh, living in Vegas in the 70s? It's scary. <laughs> uh, we hear stories about that. The Tropicana was known as the last mafia hotel. Oh, okay. And uh, anyway, Jack With a name like Dabella, you probably yeah, fit right in. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they used to nickname me Frankie Two Fingers. That's what they <laughs> called me. <laughs> and uh, so it's, and Jack ended up selling it six years later. He was forced to sell it, but uh, by the gaming commission. But it was quite an experience. It was the last really great days of Vegas. Where, really? Yeah. I mean, there's, you wanted to go any place to eat, you just ask a certain person, and it was paid for. Wow. No matter what hotel it was at, no matter where it was, everything was always taken care of, you know. Nice. But, but it was a lot of fun. My wife didn't like it. I, I can she, imagine. That I was gone all the time, so I'd have to fly her up, stay, fly her back, and do all that. But I spent a lot of time there. Yeah. You know? What? Um, who were some of the... A-listers you were rubbing elbows with in those days. Oh, uh, Ronnie Dangerfield, he appeared there. And Liberace, uh, he appeared at Caesars, and I'd always go over to see him. And Jerry Lewis, I'd see him all the time that I was there. Uh, Any other crooners? Dean Martin. Uh, Dean Martin and I were friends. Uh, it was just a lot of, lot of fun. 
Everybody thought because I was the accountant of the Tropicana, I was in the mafia, which I wasn't. It was just, right. that's what they thought. Well, and and maybe because of your Italian heritage, yeah, <laughs> that might have had something well, to do I'm, with it. I'm Sicilian. There's, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a, a difference. difference. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So in 1991, you uh, opened the Planet Hollywood with yes. Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, Sylvester Stallone. Right. And that was here in Santa Ana, right? Santa Ana, South Coast Plaza. Yeah. Lasted for... Uh, seven years and then Arnold and I uh, I had a what was the franchise the only franchise and Arnold and I had a meeting and we said we got to get out of this uh, he's building too many too fast so we sold our interest uh-huh. so I got out of just in time a year later they filed bankruptcy oh wow 80 some planet Hollywoods were gone wow mm. so were you actually working as a CPA for that or you were just an investor I was the owner okay yeah Wow. I had a, I, it was the franchise cost two million dollars, and uh, we used to use it for a lot of uh, charity functions. Uh, Bobby Hadfield, I'd, I'd, his wife had lupus, and charity function there, and the Righteous Brothers would sing, and uh, we donated a lot of money through Planet Hollywood. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. What was it like uh, working with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Oh, he's he's a great guy. He's He'd come out and we'd go shopping in South Coast Plaza. All the other movie stars would bring a bodyguard. Arnold never had a bodyguard. Mm. He just walked around like nothing. He's Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's, Nobody's yeah. going to try to mess with him. <laughs> exactly. You know, so it was a lot of fun yeah. while it lasted. Yeah. What about Sylvester Stallone? He was a lot of fun. He was at the, uh, uh, the groundbreaking. Uh, Arnold couldn't make it. But... Uh, he was uh, he was a good guy. He was a good guy. And then there was uh, Demi Moore and Bruce Willis. They were also partners. Oh, very cool. Yeah. 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 Well, tell me, um, is that is that how you got? Was that transition when you uh, left Vegas, or you left at the closing of the Tropicana, or when they sold the Tropicana? <clears throat> I left uh, when he sold the Tropicana in eighty one. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you were back in. Then I went back to my CPA practice. That's awesome. Well, it's no secret that over the years you've had some many big name clients. Um, in addition to Jerry Lewis and Arnold Schwarzenegger, there was also Aristotle Onassis, yes. Liberace, Liberace. Um, locally Milan Ponick, um, Gary Jabara, and of course the late Paul Musco. Uh, I know you and Paul were the closest of friends, and I know that you're going to be speaking at his funeral soon. Tell me a little bit about Paul Musco. He was a wonderful man. Um, very charitable. Mm-hmm. Whenever, like with muscular dystrophy, when he found out I was involved, how much you need? Let's be frank about how much you need. You know, and he's given me millions of dollars. Yeah. And he's just, uh, when he went into the hospital, this was about four months before he died, uh, his wife says he's going to go into hospice. And I said, oh, no. So, the next morning, I get a phone call. Where's lunch, Frank? I said, lunch? He goes, yeah, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. So Aww. we had lunch. We had lunch every day, every day. Supposed to have lunch with him the Friday that he died, but I couldn't make it, and uh, he ended up dying. Uh, but he was a wonderful, wonderful person. What was your favorite lunch spot? Uh, we went to Antonello's. It was great. Uh, Bastango's, Canaletto's. We went to different restaurants yeah. every day, every day. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, Liberace was another client and yes. a good friend. Mm-hmm. Tell me some stories about Liberace. Uh, one in particular, he never turned down an autograph. Ever, wow. Ever. He always was a wonderful person. And uh, I had a limo pick him up in Palm Springs and with his neighbors who... I knew really well. We went to Antonello's. And so I invited my mom and dad. I invited my in-laws. So there was about 12 people at a table. And then right next to us was a table of 10. And they were celebrating. They went public. Mm-hmm. And they went, this girl came over to the table and says, would you sign this for me? She says, I'm eating right now. And she went back to the table. So after we're through eating, he said, get me a menu. And I got him a menu. Get everybody's name. And he wrote everybody's name, drew a candelabra, get a camera. I had to send somebody to buy a camera. 
<laughs> take a picture for each one of them. I had to make eight by tens, their address, and mail them to them. Oh, That's the wow. kind of guy he was. He was oh just gosh. wonderful, wonderful yeah. person. Yeah. Well, I also heard a story that he might have uh, tried to seduce you in his Malibu mansion. <laughs> yeah. He he always wanted me. I said, Lee, I'm not gay. My twin brother's gay. You <laughs> could have him, but not me. Uh, you should have tried to set that up. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, Were you uh, identical twins or fraternal no, twins? No, fraternal twins. Okay. Fraternal twins. Yeah, so you maybe were the better looking of the two. <laughs> yeah. You never know. Yeah. So, Frank, we do a little thing here called Bing Questions, Mm -hmm. and uh, this is where we dive deep and get you to reveal all your inner secrets. Mm -hmm. Do you have any consistent daily routines? I pray 50 times a day. 50 times? 50 times a day. I pray every night. Over and over, I say the Lord's Prayer. And I started doing that when I was taking radiation because I'm claustrophobic, and they had to they made a body cast, put me in this tongue. And I just said the Lord's Prayer over and over and over again. And that's when I became religious, when I my religion came back. Wow. Yeah. So had you lost it at some point? Yes. Time? Yeah, I had lost it. Uh, when I was nine, I lost it. When my grandfather died. Hmm. But it came back. Yeah. Well, they, you, it's important to have it when you need it, right? Yes, Absolutely. <laughs> Tell me something that people would be surprised to know about you. Number one, that I'm that religious. Most of them think I'm crazy, but uh, <laughs> that's that's about it. Everybody knows everything about me. I I just I, found out that you have a Bloody Mary every morning. Every, every <laughs> single morning I have a cup of coffee and a Bloody Mary. Dr. Powell doesn't like it, but I like it. Um, and I have... Uh, Two tequila shots every night before I go to bed. I got a man with his routine. Yeah. There you go. Tell me, what do you think is the purpose of life? To enjoy what we have here on earth as long as we can, because it's a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And just to be happy. I agree. Yeah. Follow the path of joy. Can you tell me a piece of advice that you were given that you've always remembered? Well, my dad sent me away to military school, so he said, stay away from women. (laughs) So I always remember that. (laughs) Whether you followed it or not is another story. I didn't follow it, but (laughs) I was 15 at the time. But uh, that's, that's about it, you know. Tell me, what do you think is the biggest issue that's facing our world today? Putin and Russia. That's very prevalent I'm a, I'm right now. I'm afraid somebody's going to use the nuclear weapon mm. and all hell's going to break loose. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but we'll see. Tell me something that you used to believe, but you don't anymore. I used to believe that people could get along, but uh, ever since I went to Vietnam, I don't believe that anymore. Mm. I, I just, I want to but it just doesn't happen. What did, uh, what did you learn about the world or your, about yourself when you went to Vietnam? Oh, life is precious. Uh, when you're out in the jungle, you, you don't know if you're going to live or die. Uh, it's, uh, it was quite an experience, quite an experience. Still, I had it down, 11 months, 28 days, and had it down to hours and minutes that I, that I was there. But it's been so long. I uh, came home in 1969. Uh, uh, and then that was one of the things I, my daughter was born one month after I went to Vietnam. Mm. And I asked, so the gov- I asked the government, let me stay one more month for my daughter to be born. And, nope, you got to go. And. I hated the government for doing that. Mm. I even wrote the president and uh, President Bush at the time, I wrote him a letter saying, don't ever send anybody to war unless you're prepared to use a nuclear weapon. Otherwise, life is too valuable. There's no need. You know, If you're prepared to use a nuclear weapon, then we're in trouble. But don't send, it, don't send us to war anymore. 
We lost 55,000 guys in Vietnam and women. Tell me a goal that you've yet to reach. Oh. Finding the cure for cancer. That's what I'm hoping for. But you're working at it. Yep. Yep. I saw it. You were raised in Montebello. Yes. Went to college at Cal State LA. Yes. I always love when I meet LA people. I'm a, I'm a homegrown LA girl too. too. Yeah. Not too many of us around. Most people come here later. You almost attended SC, but yeah. you got drafted. Got drafted. And um, tell me a little bit about, um, you know, you got home from Vietnam. How did you get into being a CPA? My dad was a CPA. Okay. So as soon as I got back from Vietnam, I, I had six months left to do in the service in Washington. And then I studied for my CPA exam and passed it. And uh, when I came back, little did I know, my dad bought a bank and I took over his practice. So that's how I got started. It was just there waiting for me. Wow. Yeah. And is that something that you enjoyed? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I enjoy. He wanted me to take over his bank, and I said no. I didn't. I didn't want to do. It. I didn't like it. So, well, obviously, with the types of clients that you've attracted, you're obviously very good at what you do. Why do you think it is that so many of the heavy hitter clients come to work with you? Actually, things changed in '76 when Jack Urich asked me to come to Vegas, mm -hmm. and uh, people were saying. Hell, if he's good enough to do the taxes at the Tropicana, must be pretty good. Mm -hmm. So I started getting a ton of clients mm -hmm. and heavy-duty clients. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's how it all started. Yeah. yeah. And when you came back to uh, Orange County, it's, those are the same word-of-mouth clients that were referred oh, yeah. to you? Yeah. I never advertised. It's, it's all been word-of-mouth. 11 years after your diagnosis? You still are running two offices, <laughs> yeah. over 500 individual clients. Yes. What is it that, uh, do you, how much of a role do you think that a positive mindset has played in your ability to fight cancer? 100%. It's when you keep your mind busy and you keep it off the cancer, it's, it really helps. It yeah, really helps. I wake up with something to do. If I didn't have my practice, I'd wake up in the morning and sit around and drink coffee and Bloody Marys all day. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound like a bad life. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Then I'd become an alcoholic. Your daughter Gina works with you? Yes. 20 years she's been working for me. Yeah, She runs the Whittier office. Yeah. And you have a beautiful fiancé, Claudette, that I Claudette, got to meet yeah. at the last event. We've been together for seven years now. Yeah. That's wonderful. What... What do you want Frank DeBella to be remembered for? What's your legacy going to be? Being part of finding the cure for cancer. That's all I care about. Right. And you're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. Enjoyed having you here today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Delphine Circle. Don't forget to subscribe. It's free and it will help us keep these incredible interviews coming your way. Here are two other episodes you may enjoy. I'm Delphine. Welcome to my circle.